good. There we go. All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Merrimack School Board for April 15th, 2024. I'd like to call this meeting to order and start uh, by joining me with the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you very much. Uh, tonight's meeting is going to start with a public hearing uh, intended to uh, discuss or for the board to authorize the purchase of security cameras and access control from the SAFE SAFE Grant 3 in the amount of $387,127. I want to turn that over to Mr. Chevenel. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, a while back, it was October, I forget what, what day it was, but at 1030, they opened up the grant application window, and it was first come, first served, so I was ready to go at 1030 in the morning, hitting that button over and over again to apply for this grant. What it consists of is um, twofold, a surveillance function and a access control function. So what that means to us is more security cameras for the school district. We already have around 200 or so cameras. We want to add to that in critical locations that we will talk to the principals about where they think they would like them because they know their building best and where we would like them also because we have input to that too. So it, it includes that, and it also includes lock sets. So we went through, did a complete inventory of all the lock sets in the school district, and there are a number that, we, that are old that we'd like to replace, and there are some that don't lock from the inside. Those are very few, but those are some that don't lock from the inside. Because <clears throat> the last thing you want to do when there's an emergency is have to open the door to the threat to lock the door from the outside and close it. That's not good. So they'll be keyed on both, both areas. The amount, the number of security cameras where we have, we're going to be asking for, I'm not sure yet because we're having companies do a, a site survey of our existing system. They're going to evaluate it because certain spaces like the high school, the current server and the current configuration won't allow us to add any more cameras. So we have to upgrade that server. I've already talked with my buddy Chris at the state, who's in charge of the Safe 3 grants, and he says that is something we can put in for. So I can modify the grant to fit our needs. So it's going to be an evolving process. Uh, all, all the funds for this have to be committed by June 1st, and everything has to be installed and operational and paid for by December 31st of 2024. So when you're dealing with electronics and everything like that and labor, because a lot of this is going to be labor intensive, that's kind of a tight window, but that's a state-imposed window. I talked with Michelle Clark at, Michelle Clark, Amy Clark at uh, school facilities. She's in charge of that at the state. And she said the, the state, because it is state money, it's not a federal rule, it's a state rule, that they may extend that depending upon how the districts are doing. Uh, we were probably one of the first ones out of the 30 applications that they have. There's probably 100 total, and that have been, it's been approved by the state of New Hampshire, this entire amount. So we went through the grant process, went through all the signatures that we had to get. I want to thank Ken and Bill for signing 12 copies of attestation forms and triplicates. It's like Alice's Restaurant, the part of the song that keeps going around, the 8 by 10 color glossies or the whatever. So they just had to keep doing that so we could scan those and attach them to each grant individually. So there's a lot of paperwork involved, but for close to 400 grand, I'd rather have the state pay for it than the taxpayers pay for it. So basically that's what's going on, that's the process, uh, and that's how we get to this point right now. I was, they weren't sure if I had to hold a public hearing so in case they make that rule after the fact, I am just want to cover us by doing a public hearing. I don't want any surprises later on. So this is why we're having the public hearing right now. And if there's any input from the public, you know, I'll turn it over to Chairman Martin to ask if anybody wants to speak or they have any questions. 
Great, and we'll do that right now. If there's any questions that folks in the audience have, or if you wish to speak on the SAFE grant authorization, you are welcome to come to the mic. Just make sure to state your name and address for the record. And if you're a student, no need to state your address, just your name. Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to, um, well, in do order we to, to- Do we have to vote? I would like, a, just because yeah. this is a process, I would like a vote of the board, please, if so you could. I, well, I'll ahead. make a motion that we accept the safe grant um, in the amount of $387,127. And I'll second and uh, open it up to discussion if there is any. All those in favor of accepting the safe grant for $387,120,000? Thank you. Thank you very much. May I make a comment? Yeah. You know, I have worked with a lot of people over many years. And I don't think I've worked with anyone who is as attuned and active with respect to making schools as safe as possible as Matt. So I want to congratulate him. He is right at the starting line whenever there is any money in terms of any grant, state or federal, any monies, local sources for school safety. So Matt, thank you for that because uh, as I said, I've worked with a lot of people. I don't think anybody's been as active as him in making sure our students and our staff are as safe as possible. I know we already voted, but I just thought of a question that seemed pertinent. Um, actually, the answer seems obvious, but I thought I'd say it out loud. Um, are there? Does this obligate us to any ongoing costs in the future, or is this a one-time purchase covered by the grant? It's a one-time purchase covered by the grant, but depending upon the number of security cameras, we will have to put them on our uh, security camera maintenance plan, which is part of the uh, uh, operating budget and maintenance, and so it would probably be an extra $20,000 worth of, you know, service that has, it's like a service contract. They come, they clean, they align, they focus two, three times a year. Yeah, that, that, may I just say that's, that's a very important question to ask because oftentimes when uh, school districts bring forth capital improvement plans, what they don't say is what the impact on the operating budget will be for future years. And that's extraordinarily important for everyone to understand that we may spend $2 million, $4 million, $10 million, or, or $5 on something, and there may be some operating budget impact, which is important for you and for the public to know. So that's always a very pertinent question to, to yeah. ask. Yeah, so for the first year, it's free. For the year after, probably the 25, mid, uh, probably January 1st of 2026 20, and going on, it'll be a half year, and then it'll be a full year after that, 26, 27. So that's a great question. Thank you. All right. Uh, then I will call this public hearing to a close, and we will move on to our uh, scheduled agenda for this evening. Uh, and the first order of business tonight is the school board reorganization. Uh, I want to first of all congratulate uh, Jenna Hardy and Lori Peters uh, on their recent uh, election, re-election to the school board. I'm very, very happy to have you back um, and excited to continue our work here uh, together. <clears throat> uh, so with that, um, I would like to make a motion to nominate Lori Peters to take over as school board chair for and this I upcoming year. I will second year. that. Uh, and um, I'll start with um, discussion for my reasoning why uh, I'm going to be nominating Lori tonight. Um, having worked with Lori for the last couple of years, um, it is very clear um, how motivated Lori is to improve this district in so many different ways. Um, listening to her insight and depth of knowledge when it comes to curriculum and instruction, um, knowing how schools work, having worked in so many different areas of school uh, of schools, whether it's public and private, um, it's it gives a, a knowledge base that not a lot of people have. And um, uh, one of the things, again, you go back and look at her uh, resume for the work that she's done with this district. Um, 
the MESA contract that was just overwhelmingly passed. She was directly involved in the negotiations of the MTA contract that was passed last year that she was directly involved with the negotiations of. Um, the approval of wit and wisdom, the uh, reading programs that have been developed over the last couple of years. She was right there um, approving and, um, and assisting with all of that work. So to me, it's uh, plus with their work as vice chair a few years ago, um, this, this makes a lot of sense to me to nominate her tonight. Um, I know folks out there, um, there's, there's a lot of conversation about um, the role that, that politics play in school boards these days. Um, I think Merrimack has a school board that kind of defines what moderate, moderation means. Uh, when, I, when I talk to the folks up here on the board, Ideo political ideologies never come up in our conversations. I never hear anybody mention, you know, uh, you know, the R words or the D words and all those things. That never ever happens. Um, so for the folks out there that feel that you need to have a political bias when you run for something like this, I think the folks up here prove how wrong that is all the time. Uh, and I think Lori is a perfect example of that. So that's why I'm nominating Lori tonight. Uh, so, other discussion? I have a question yeah. for you. <laughs> um, what do you see as the board's biggest priority in the coming year, and how um, will you, being chair, um, will you move that forward? I think the biggest challenge we face right now is th that we're working within the default budget, and that is going to require uh, wise decision making making decisions that are fiscally responsible but are care and person oriented. And so one of the things that I look forward to doing as chair is working closely with administration. Um, I have decided to take a sabbatical this next year, so I will be able to spend more time actually visiting the schools with Bill and with Amy, getting a firsthand look to be able to report back to the board what we're seeing at the ground level as we f face that default budget, as we make decisions, as we move forward this year. I just want to say, um, you know, I don't. People don't know this, but we're part of the New Hampshire School Board Association, and they they provide um, all sorts of trainings. And one thing that I watched Lori quietly do was take. I don't know about all of them, but probably close to all, okay, all of them. I knew they were all of them. I just want to say, <laughs> she just really does everything with excellence. Um, she has made it her job to learn how to be a really exemplary school board member, and she will serve us very well. And if there is no more discussion, we'll call it to a vote. All those in favor of Lori Peters as school board chair, say aye. Aye. Five zero zero. Before I go, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I want to. I want to give you a hug. Yeah. Ben, you did a great job. All right. Thanks. All right. Uh, now accepting uh, nominations for uh, vice chair for the school board. I'd like to nominate Jen Hardy for vice chair of the school board. And I will second. Uh, discussion. I, I'll start. So I think look, through the years, Lori and Jenna have formed a great team. Jenna is passionate. If you watch school board meetings or budget meetings, she's fearless leader. She cares about our district. She has endless enthusiasm and energy. And um, right now we're in a position where uh, we're rebuilding. And so we're going to need th those um, skills. Uh, and I, I will echo all those sentiments. Um, Jenna is in the thick of it. She, she knows what's going on in our schools. She has, a, again, a, an incredible depth of knowledge, uh, not only as a student uh, from our Merrimack School District, but also um, working with her children and uh, all across our school district. So um, I know that whenever I have questions about programs or curriculum, she's one of the first people I go to. Uh, and it's, I, I know she's going to do a great job in that position. Out. And I will add to that that Jenna and I started in the same place on budget committee. And so we worked through being on the budget committee and then on the school board. And Jenna has done an excellent job of coming prepared, looking at things. She's, she is very passionate, but also willing to make the hard choices, even when um, it may not be the thing that she likes. But she, she acts with integrity here on the board. And so I appreciate the, 
the partnership we have built and the work we have done, it's it's been a an incredible three years. <laughs> very, we're in a very different place than we were three years ago. And I think she will do great as vice chair. I'm going to ask the same question, although the vice chair is, is less of a hands-on role. But where, what do you think the board's biggest priority is the next coming year? And uh, how will the vice chair role assist with that? Well, certainly, I, I, I agree with what Lori said. Certainly, functioning in default is definitely one of those but it's going to be functioning in default while keeping up the striving for excellence the improvements that we've tried to make and building on those we've done a lot of work in k-6 to and i would like to see that continue in 7th through 12th um, as we look at programs and evaluate how we can make everything the best it can be without you know burdening taxpayers to an unfair you know amount All those in favor of having Jenna move on up to vice chair, signify by saying aye. Aye. 500. Zero, zero. Congratulations. I'm going to move down there. Jeez, I need that thing. Oh. Well, I'd like to take a moment and just thank Ken and Lori for the fine work they've done this year as chair and vice chair. Uh, Lori, especially working on the MESA contract with me, and Ken working through all the budget issues, especially spending a lot of time reworking the SAU building proposal during winter break. I thank you both for all the hard work you've done this year. Thank you. All right, well with that, we have the first order of business for the new board, and that is the Merrimack School Board Code of Ethics. And so I am going to read the first half of this, and I will have Vice Chair Hardy read the second half, and then we sign this as board members. As a member of the Merrimack School Board, I shall promote the best interests of the district by adhering to the following ethical standards and affix my signature to the same. Trustworthy and responsibilities. I will always remember that my first and greatest concern will be the educational wel welfare of the students in the Merrimack School District. I will be accountable to the public by accurately representing district policies, programs, priorities, and progress. I will be responsive to the community by seeking its involvement in district affairs and by communicating its priorities and concerns. I will work to ensure prudent and accountable use of district resources and never lose sight of the fiscal responsibility owed to the taxpayers of the district. I will make no personal promise or take private action that may compromise my performance or my responsibilities or those of my fellow board members. I will avoid being placed in a position of conflict of interest and refrain from using my board position for personal or partisan gain. Honor in conduct. I will be honest, fair, just, and impartial in all my decisions and actions. I will encourage and respect open dialogue and listen with an open mind while working for consensus. I will respect the majority decision as the decision of the board. Integrity of character. I will consistently uphold all applicable laws, rules, policies, and district procedures. I will not disclose information that is confidential by law or that will undermine the district. Commitment to service. I will focus my attention on fulfilling the board's responsibilities of goal setting, policy making, and evaluation. I will diligently prepare for and attend board meetings. I will avoid personal involvement in activities the board has delegated to the superintendent, and I will inform myself about relevant educational issues. With that, if everyone will sign and then pass your papers this way. That's the, oh, it's, the 15th. it's April 15th, tax day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
All right. Now we will open it up to our regular public participation. As usual, if you will state your name and your address, we would appreciate it. And if you are a student, no need to, no need to state your address, just your name. And I open the floor. Good evening. Is this on? Well, I think oh, it's on. OK. Uh, first of all, congratulations so much. Chairman Peters, Chair Hardy, uh, for your election and your elevation to leadership. It's a great meeting to go to. Uh, for the record, my name is Rosemary Rung at 21 Ministerial Drive. I have uh, comments I'm going to read, but I'm going to give them to you as well afterwards. Um, as some of you may be aware, I have been a champion of public education since my first child entered school in 1992. I sat on this very board for nine years. So I know firsthand the challenges, develop, the, the challenges in developing and implementing good public policy while securing the support of the community at large. The recent election results suggest that the school district and community would benefit from increased communication, education, and engagement. To that end, I ask the board to consider establishing a few committees that can help broaden awareness, understanding, and advocacy of school district programs and policies by engaging community me members in the work you do. The first is to reestablish PERC, the Program Evaluation and Review Committee. PERC was made up of the assistant superintendent, a school board member, one to two school administrators, two to three teachers, I forget how many, and three parents and a community member, and it's one of the most enjoyable committees I've ever served on while in community service. Their charge was to review policies, programs, and projects before they went before the board. They acted as an advisory group and a resource. The insight and outside in perspective that PERC brought to their work helped identify and resolve unforeseen issues and suggested improvements so that the board had a better developed product for their consideration. The second recommendation is establishing an ad hoc committee of community members to revisit the new central office proposal. Back in the late 90s, when I served on the board, we proposed a new middle school and grade reconfiguration to accommodate public kindergarten. It was a, monum a monumental project that was met, understandably, with public skepticism, questions, and resistance. We established the Ad Hoc Special Needs Committee and appointed many of these skeptics to it. They worked in cooperation with the Planning and Building Committee. They had access to all available data, statistics, and projections to develop their own recommendation, which was, in fact, the construction of a new school. I think this community model would go a long way to bring forth a central office proposal that would garner broad community support. And I, I want to tell you, I think that getting a central office a new one built is really a high priority. It's an embarrassment, um, the working conditions that we have people working in. And I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir on that. The third recommendation is to st establish an ad hoc committee to work jointly with the town council and school board to develop a strategic plan to meet our field needs, our field recreation needs. We need to come together beyond the silos of town, school district, and MYA to develop a concrete roadmap in which all fields in Merrimack meet all our needs. I hope there is an outside the box thinking, including land use on sale of the district's McQuestion property. Finally, as a state representative, I ask that the school board consider what potential or proposed legislation is needed to support our district and perhaps schedule a meeting with state reps early in the fall as we prepare to file legislation for the new term. I think I can speak for all the state reps when I say we welcome your advice and suggestions. I've always said that public education is only as good as the public, and creating opportunities for the public to participate in school district work raises the understanding and support needed to move our school district forward. Thank you. Good evening, um, I'm Heather Robitaille, 45 Springfield Circle. Um, congratulations to our new chair and vice chair. 
I look forward to seeing the work continue that this board has been focused on and addressing the concerns that the community has brought up at meetings as of late. I think there were some creative problem solving and solutions that were discussed and I, I look forward to seeing that happen. Um, I'd like to also echo Rosemary's um, input as far as the public and communication, really increasing that. Um, that way, we're all on the same page. We all want the best for our kids in this town. Um, so I definitely think that that would be advantageous to have people with different perspectives and viewpoints and priorities, um, which I think we've heard expressed through social media, but also with our friends and neighbors. And since we are all friends and neighbors, it makes sense to have people's input, make sure we're doing the right things for the district, and make sure we're addressing the needs of our special education students through our gifted and talented. So, thank you. Jeannie Wagner for Cowan Road. Um, in the, I think it was the last school board meeting or the one before, uh, Mr. Martin, you mentioned that you had come to an agreement with the superintendent or the chief executive, chief education officer and Ms. Doyle about coming contracts. And um, as a voter in town, I was not able to find any of that information. Where do I go to, for those contracts and information? Thank you. I believe they're on the website. Just, yeah, please know that all, all contracts are public documents. So. Yeah. yeah, they're all located on the website. Thank you. Yep. If, no, we the new ones we are not, not on there yet, yet because they're for the next school year. Yeah, they just, the message just passed, so that's a new contract. Yep. So. Anyone else? All right, well, with that, we'll move on. We do have um, an opportunity at the end to address agenda items if you would like. <coughs> We're moving on to recognitions. Uh, we have no recognitions at this meeting. All right. Although we're getting close to spring, where I yes. anticipate quite a few. Yes. All right. Informational updates. Superintendent update. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, to Ken and Lori, thank you very much for your leadership, for the stability and improvement that you helped shepherd us all through. And uh, it's always challenging each fiscal year. But I want to thank you for just an outstanding job. And Lori and Jenna, congratulations. Too. We look forward to your excellent leadership, and congratulations to all the candidates um, uh, in the election. Um, it takes a lot of energy, takes a lot of initiative, takes a lot of courage to run for public office, and so whether you won or you were not successful, congratulations uh, to everyone. Um, on Thursday evening of this week, we will have a budget meeting, a public meeting here at 6 p.m. Uh, we will be proposing, uh, bringing in proposed budget reductions to you, just letting the public know in case they wish to attend and address any of the proposed reductions that we will uh, be bringing in at that time. We've had two uh, leadership team meetings in the last uh, week. <coughs> Actually, the last four, three or four work days, we've had two uh, very focused, very professional uh, meetings. Uh, none of the budget reductions are easy. And um, most of them, um, when taken individually, will, will impact someone in some way. <coughs> Whether it's a staff member in-house, a student, a parent. Um, what we try not to do in times of budget reductions is use students as pawns, okay? We take a look at data, how many students are being provided with service, how much uh, what that service looks like is it consistent with the goals that we're trying to accomplish. Um, and so we, we look at as much empirical data as possible. And what uh, we have observed as outcomes um, uh, over the last two, three, four, five years. And we are going to um, bring in some proposals that uh, in some cases uh, may be a little bit more controversial than others, but that's, that's the nature of trying to meet a budget that 
requires uh, a $2 million reduction, $1,985,000. Uh, we accept that vote because that is the democratic process. Um, once again, we will never um, use students as pawns uh, and saying, well, we're going to cut all athletics, we're going to cut all this, cut all. No, we don't do that. Okay, we look at the budget and the services that are provided pre-K through 12 strategically, and we set priorities. In some cases, there are emerging priorities that now are more important than some of the more recent and current priorities. And that's a reality that we deal with in this profession because if you remember, uh, every budget year I give you that message by Thomas Armstrong that underlines the, the difficulty of meeting the needs of all students in a school district that we're all different, which makes us all the same, essentially, but we're all wired differently with our likes and dislikes. So um, it will be challenging uh, for you. It will be challenging for the staff. We are going to have conversations with all staff. We began that today that uh, we are proposing in terms of reductions. Um, and, you know, we're, we're interested in the feedback from the parents also and from the community. Uh, so, as you know, it's a responsibility that we don't shy away from, but we take extraordinarily seriously because we're trying to keep a quality school system together. And uh, it's very difficult under these circumstances, but that is the reality of public financing of operations, whether they're town departments, whether it's a school district operation. We live with the cyclical realities of revenues, and uh, we will deal with it deal with it accordingly uh, and as responsibly as possible. So Thursday night at 6 o'clock in this, in this same room. All right. um, getting to a little bit more positive news. Uh, I want to congratulate Brenda Wygant, who was recently honored uh, as the WZID uh, Teacher of the Month. And that was a nice uh, celebration over at uh, TFS. Uh, maybe Julie can explain a little bit more about that when the elementary team comes to the microphone, but uh, speaks volumes about the quality of teachers that we have, a parent nominated, uh, Brenda, and congratulations uh, to her, and thank you to WZID for their recognition of uh, excellent teachers. Um, one of our teachers, in fact, ran in the marathon today and finished in an extraordinarily a good time of three hours and five minutes, which is incredible when you think that, um, well, as of right now and probably five hours from now, there will still be people on the course trying to complete the uh, marathon. So congratulations uh, from Josh Pelton, also at the high school. Josh is working with um, Mr. Babin at the uh, middle school level, and uh, they are going to start a uh, bowling club at the middle school. They're going to begin that after the school vacation. Uh, that's a great sport uh, because a lot of students, different students of different abilities can participate in, in bowling. Um, and uh, it's a great, great activity, great exercise, great team, uh, team building commitment. So I congratulate uh, uh, Josh and uh, Mr. Babin on um, starting the bowling team at the middle school. And um, I say this with great respect and great affection, the Get Set program at the high school um, has started the planting in their garden beds behind the building. Um, Pat Zink has let me know that they have planted the potatoes and they will be planting the peas shortly. And that is something that the students in the Get Set program and, and maybe um, Maybe we can hear uh, some more about the, uh, about the Get Set program. Um, it's a great source of great pride to us and uh, very meaningful to the students. So congratulations to Pat and the, um, and the students. And um, you know, if anybody wants to make a comment about the Get Set program from their past experience, you're very welcome. As we're very proud of that program and our students. And that is it for me from tonight. Comments from the board. <coughs> All right. 
Assistant Superintendent Update. Good evening, everyone. I just want to echo um, Bill's and everyone's congratulations. Congratulations on your reelection and move to chair and, and vice chair. And congratulations to everyone in the room that ran and uh, secured a position. I look forward to working uh, with all of you. Um, so a couple of news from, from my end. We had a great middle school science curriculum meeting today. You missed it, Julie. Julie's typically on that committee, but you can see that she can't drive, so we couldn't have the meeting with her. Um, and we're very close to making a decision um, about what materials we're going to use in grades six through eight. You may remember that we've talked a lot about K through five um, when we adopted Mystery Science. We've also done some work with freshmen and sophomores, ensuring that they have up-to-date materials. But um, in grades six through eight, We've made some real progress there, so we're excited to bring that forth soon uh, to share with all of you. Um, similarly, our teacher evaluation model, um, we continue to meet with a, a representative committee from across the district, as well as administrators and members of the MTA, um, and we are also very close there on uh, providing a new model. Um, we're gonna cross our fingers that that will be implemented next school year. Um, we've been able to really look at the rubrics and the process to ensure that it's growth-oriented and meeting the needs of not just new teachers, but also teachers that have been here for a while um, and need the, and the kind of feedback that they need to grow and to in, improve and expand their practice. Um, planning and preparation for summer of 2024 is gearing up and of course I'll have more to share in the meetings ahead. Thank you. Comments from the board. All right we'll move on to assistant superintendent for business. Matt Shevino. Yeah thank you. Um, you probably forgot about this and it could have probably slipped your mind but a while back, you had authorized us to uh, put a scoreboard where the football field was. And I'm sorry, I should have put it up on the thing, but this will have to do. You have a school, you have a new scoreboard on the football field. It's going to be operational this week. Custom Electric's coming down to hook it up. It has new controllers. The LED lights will change colors and everything like that. It's going to be a really great addition. The thing is pretty large and it's Merrimack blue and it has it's adorned with all the Merrimack logos just outstanding looking production so I just want to let you know that that's been completed and uh, we'll be we'll give you I'll do a little video you can see the the different colors that it changes so it'll be interesting to see thank you that's about it for me thank you any comments from the board all right, moving on to the school board update. I want to thank the voters of Merrimack. You came out, more than 4,000 ballots were cast, which is wonderful. That's a fantastic turnout over last year. And I want to thank everyone who ran. It is incredibly difficult to go and put your name down and say, I'm going to run for a position and then actually get out there and campaign as well. And when people don't know you, you never know how they're going to react. You might get um, praised on social media. You might get crucified on social media. Either way, it takes a lot of courage to run for a position, and I want to thank all those who ran and congratulate those who have new positions this year. I'd also like to remind everyone, as Bill did, uh, that Thursday night's meeting is very important. So we will be discussing some very serious changes that are going to occur due to our default budget situation, and so I encourage the public to be a part of that meeting and if you cannot be here please watch it online so that you are informed about what is coming and lastly i would just like to thank once again this amazing board i'm looking forward to working with you for another year and i look forward to working with our amazing central office and the amazing staff and faculty here in merrimack for another year all right moving on to our student representative update all right. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for all being here. And again, I wanted to echo the sentiments of everyone. Congratulations to those who ran, uh, those who were elected, and thank you to those for their service on the board. You've all done an amazing job, and I'm really excited to be working with you. So um, I wanted to spend some time for this meeting revisiting something that we talked about in the last meeting, the Merrimack Music Program. As many of you may know, this past um, last weekend, April 6th, we had several amazing students from the high school participate in the All-State Festival on behalf of the New Hampshire Music Educators Association. And so I wanted to take a minute to first of all congratulate all of those students for an amazing concert. It was great. We had great attendance and lots of ensembles performed. It was a lot of work, but it sounded great. Um, and we persevered through the snow also, which was great to see. 
And I wanted to specifically congratulate those who won some amazing awards representing MHS. So for the four-year awards, which is an amazing honor, students who have participated in this festival for all four years of their high school experience, we have Chase Rowe, myself, uh, Jennifer Epstein, and Trey Grant for Jazz All-State. And in addition, we had several students get awards for the top ranking score on their instrument. So that's out of all the schools in New Hampshire. So that's a really big honor. So we have Dave Sharma on baritone saxophone, Hikari McDowell on tenor saxophone, Owen Sabins on bassoon, and Chase Rowe, myself, on a timpani, snare drum, and mallet percussion. So congratulations again to all those students. We're really, really proud of our music program. Also on April 6th, we had the statewide annual Destination College event on behalf of MHS. Uh, for that day, MHS invited juniors to attend St. Anselm College for a day of um, a variety of college planning workshops, tips about college application processes, and learn from experts in the field to ac and attend college fairs as well, and just learn in general more about the college application process. So thank you to MHS for sponsoring that event. It was a really great opportunity for our juniors. And moving over to Student Council, we have some exciting developments for the Junior Student Council Class of 2025 and the Sophomore Student Council Class of 2026. This past Friday, the Class of 2026 held a school-wide spring fling dance, very exciting, uh, which was 7 to 10 p.m. in the MHS cafeteria. And I myself did not attend, but I heard it was great. I saw posters everywhere, really, really great work to everyone in the Class of 2026, so thank you for putting that on. And also, the Class of 2025 Student Council is starting to prepare for the Fire Five Play themed upcoming junior prom on May 10th on Friday at the Doubletree in Manchester. So juniors, very exciting event. And thank you again so much for the Class of 2025 for preparing that. That's it for me. And well, I just want to say, oh, sorry. Oh, no, uh, go ahead. Uh, please go ahead. I was just I was gonna, gonna say, I, I whoo, ladybug. Um, <laughs> that it is just, again, a major testimony to the music program here in Merrimack. And congratulations to all of the students who uh, just did the district proud. And even in the snow, I was, I was so concerned about the snow and the competition. So congratulations. And I was going to say, we will look forward to recognizing all those students at our next, uh, uh, probably not the budget meeting coming up, but our next regular scheduled meeting. And uh, just because I was there as well, not performing, um, but uh, they lost Thursday night due to the snowstorm. So they lost about five hours of rehearsal time and just like crammed it all into Friday. Uh, and that, it's a marathon of a day. So th these guys were incredible. I watched the whole thing happen. It was awesome to see. All right. We will go on to old business with the review outcomes of the school district elections and the warrant articles. Well, we've already made some uh, comments, certainly about the operating budget. Um, and you know what we're seeing around the state um, and around the region throughout New England is um, a lot of budgets that are not being approved. Um, never fault the voters for any action that they take, and we will adjust accordingly. We, um, uh, we thank uh, those voters for approving the roof project. Um, and Matt, um, any comments that you want to make in particular about the other warrant articles? Well, you um, you mentioned the sports staff contract. That was, I just want to say I appreciate that immensely. That was one of these things that was critical to get passed, and I appreciate the support of the public to do that. You know, our food service people, they're, make, they're currently making $11 an hour. The custodians, we haven't hired one in four years. They are, they are like the backbone of, of they're, they're part of the infrastructure and what makes, makes a school district work. And the paraprofessionals, my gosh, what, what, what they do during a day's work is absolutely incredible. So I just want to really sincerely thank the public for supporting the uh, support staff contract. That was really important to everybody sitting here at this table. Yeah. I say we always respectfully refer to those people who are covered by the MESA contract as the unsung heroes in the school department. You don't see them a lot, you don't hear them about them a lot, but they show up day in and day out and make an extraordinary difference and prove that everyone matters in the operation of a, of a school system. 
I'd also like to add that the whole process this year was great to see the town of Merrimack come out at the deliberative session and the an amount of emails and contacts that we had asking good questions about the warrant articles, about the budget, about the MESA contract. And I think of the years that I can think of in the last five, six years, um, other than COVID, uh, this year we had the most participation and that was wonderful to see. And I want to echo my thanks for the MESA contract. That was um, an incredible negotiation process and those those people on the, that are covered by that contract are wonderful, wonderful people. And again, we don't see all that they do a lot of times, but they're critical to the function of our district. And so I want to thank the voters for that, as well as the roof project so our kids don't get wet. <laughs> I'm very grateful for that as well. And I thank you for your voice on the budget, on the SAU building. Everything was heard, and we appreciate that. So I don't know where to say what I have to say, but I'm going to say it here because it relates to this. Um, you know, one of the things I've learned through this budget cycle, especially, you know, when we initially said, you know, we needed to cut a million dollars and that that translated into some cuts that were uncomfortable. And we saw a lot of people show up and say they didn't, you know, like those cuts and that they, they were uncomfortable. I just want to express my concern or just uh, I don't know how, how don't, I don't I don't I've never done this before in my three years on the board this is the first time that we've had to do default so I know we're having this meeting on on um, Thursday on Thursday what's you know you'll present what you think needs to happen there'll be public comment in the beginning before anybody has heard any of it and there'll be public comment at the end which if we do the meeting and make all our decisions will be after the decisions are made. My concern and, and what I learned from, from the previous cuts was that people want to have their voices heard before the decisions are finalized. I'm not saying we have to make a decision on how that's going to work. I just want to voice that concern because it's something that as I'm thinking through how Thursday is going to go and I know we're up against the timeline and I, I know we can't just you know take a month to think it through and, and do whatever. I, I just... I just want to make sure there's time for people to whatever is presented will probably have a motion attached to it at some, on some level and people are going to want to to have a voice into it before we vote and finalize it and I don't know how that'll work for if we're going to do it all in one meeting or how that I I just wanted to say that out loud I I, I don't know how that how we change anything to make that work or whatever but we understand the importance of, of public feedback and you are the representatives of the public, uh, kind of their eyes and ears. We respect the input. Uh, what makes it all, always uh, makes it difficult is that somebody will be impacted, um, a program or a service, uh, and that becomes personal to a family, which is very understandable. Uh, it's just um, what we're trying to do is uh, make logical choices out of a very difficult situation um what we don't do is we don't throw darts at a, at a dartboard you know we, we sit down as a leadership team and we say you know we, we enter this meeting as a unified entity and we're going to leave this meeting as a unified entity and uh, we're going to think about what's in the best interest of students with the recognition that we have two million dollars to cut so something has to go and um you know, not everyone will agree with us uh, with the uh, decisions we've made, but um, we are here to serve you and the public, and we'll receive that feedback and, and act accordingly. Ken. Um, and yeah, just as someone who spent a lot of time working on the SAU building, um, I think I, I would be lying if I said or we said we were surprised by the outcome uh, just based on the, the feedback we received. And I just want to thank uh, our incredible legendary town moderator for colorfully putting it as going down in flames. <laughs> Uh, so thank you for that um, message received. But uh, I, I just, again, as, and we said this through, all throughout the process, 
Um, this issue isn't going away. Uh, we are going to continue to look at options to house our SAU staff because as many of you have said tonight uh, and in the past, it is a, it is a dire situation. So um, we have our work cut out for us, but we do plan on continuing to examine what our options are for that because it does need to be fixed and fixed very, very soon. Um, but again, I um, also want to echo f um, just the, the turnout um, and when it comes to the, the, the budget, uh, you know, and the results of the budget, um, you know, we understand, we understand why people, there, there's real concerns out there about taxes and price increases and inflation and the cost of things. It's a scary time for a lot of folks. We hear that. Um, and I think Bill said it best. We're not angry about it. We understand. We're going to do the best we can by the folks of this town to try to um, accommodate to that. Uh, while at the same time doing the best job we possibly can for the students of Merrimack. So again, thanks. Lori and then Naomi. So I just want to say that um, I think with the SAU building, uh, the new central office, we're still waiting for the fire department report. And I think uh, not having that report is part of the reason that we had the failure because so many people said, where is that report? And so I don't know how to speed up the process. Uh, I understand there, there were some of the reasons why we couldn't get the report, but I think that report is, is critical for us moving forward. And then <clears throat> finally, on the uh, $2 million cuts to the budget, um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna do the best job that we can do. Uh, this is going to, um, there, n people aren't gonna be happy because there's gonna be some programs cut I do want to say that I think it's really important for our community to understand when a school district budget fails that um, we're an accredited school district and so immediately we have to contact NEASC which accreditates us because this is a uh, definable situation where we're in default and so uh, it's really critical that the community understands that um, we have obligations to meet within that NIAS, within our accreditation. And so we have to, when we start to make these cuts, we have to be obligated to our accreditation to keep our accreditation. So some things are gonna go that, that are not a part of that accreditation, if that makes sense. And just, and before we get to Naomi, uh, just a, a final thought on that. Um, uh, the further down that path we go, we, list, we risk losing accreditation. So we just wanna make sure that information is out there. Um, we will do the best we can to accommodate this year, but it is a very real um, thing down the road um, to consider going forward in future budget cycles. Sorry, Naomi. Hey, Naomi, can I jump in on what they just said? <laughs> <laughs> not okay. Having just been through the NEASC accreditation process myself at, at my school, just to clarify, there's a standard that says, do you have enough money to run your district? And do the voters support that? So the challenge for us as a board is to present a budget for the next school year that we as a community can get behind. So what we are looking at, and this goes back to the question Naomi asked me as chair, is we are going to be working hard, not just to deal with this year's default, but to put together a budget that's the the community does support because the NEASC sees that that okay there was a one-off year they reorganized they rebuilt and now the community stands behind the budget Naomi I, I actually before I say what I was gonna say before I have something also to kind of add on to that but I'm gonna need a minute to collect my thoughts sorry um, we talked about this when we began this budget cycle um, about how in the past a lot of times a board might want to play it safe and propose a budget that's like right at default or just below default and in essence that robs the community of a choice and what we did this year was we gave the community a choice and i'm really proud that we gave the community that choice we got we got feedback um but that's just that NEASC accreditation that's one of the reasons why you can see why a board might do that why they might play it safe um, instead of putting themselves out there and saying, hey, this is what we need. Um, 
and and providing the community with that choice. So I'm I'm proud that we did that. I can understand why uh, people might do it differently, and I, I wanted the community to see that too. Um, that there's just all kinds of layers and reasons and and thing that, that that things happen the way they happen. Um, my takeaway from the election um, is that I'm, as everybody else, I'm very, very grateful that the MESA contract passed and I'm very grateful that the roofs passed. And I was looking at the numbers and it was the same on the town side. The, the, the ball fields, those failed and their budget, their operating budget also failed. And the things that passed on the town side were um, labor contracts and capital reserve investments um, and projects for small projects for improvement. And I'm getting a really clear message from that, which is that the community um, is valuing the things that are going to keep moving the needle forward. They're valuing our staff. They're valuing our infrastructure. And they said, whoa, hold on, hit the brakes this year. It's too much to be doing um, really, um, I'm not sure how to word this, to, to, be doing, to be doing bigger projects like that. Like, we need you to take a step back. We need you to look at it a little bit more. And I'm happy to be able to do that for the community. Um, part of the reason I asked Jenna and Lori the question I asked them when we were talking about the chair and vice chair is because I've been thinking about it, and I see one of the board's biggest priorities this year, and they both kind of spoke to this, as, okay, the two things that the community gave us that hard feedback on were the budget and the SAU. And I see the board, and we've heard that in the public comments, I see us needing to figure out uh, better avenues of communication so we can have those conversations, and like you were saying, so we can get a budget that the community can get behind. Um, I really want to see us working with the Planning and Building Committee um, to bring forward uh, another proposal for what what are we going to do for our SAU facilities because they are not adequate. Um, and how are we going to get the word out there and how are we going to, to get the feedback and get something that the community can get behind. And I want to see us working with the Budget Committee um, to work together to create a budget that the community can get behind. Lori. So I, I, I echo a lot of that you said, and I appreciate what um, Representative Rung said because she offered us some really solid feedback on how to improve communication by engaging more people in our community. So I want to take uh, the public comments really seriously as we move ahead and, and get some of those committees back because then people will have a better understanding of, of the role that we're playing. Something that's hard about communication is we're we're sitting here in this meeting um, to to do the business of the school district. Like there's certain things that we have to talk about and we have to vote on, and in, in, in order for the school district to function, right? Um, it's hard to have a conversation in these meetings. That's not really what these meetings are for. And I would love. Folks don't reach out to me as much as I wish they would. I see a lot on social media, and as a board member, I'm not sure if any of us have really said this out loud, you, you really can't comment on social media for a lot of reasons. The biggest one is there are all kinds of rules with the right to know laws about as soon as three of us chime in on something, we have a quorum, and then it becomes an unannounced public meeting. And so out of respect for each other, for the most part, we avoid commenting on social media because you don't want like two people to rush in and then all of a sudden nobody else can comment on it. Um, so I, I don't know how to fix that, but I do see it as a need where we need to be, we need to be communicating more in the ways that people want to engage with us because that's another, people are really, they want to engage on social media. Um, but they're, we're, we're very bound by law and it makes it very challenging. And um, I just want to encourage people when you email, um, ask questions if you can. Why did you come to this decision? Um, because we get a lot of position statements as well, and it's very hard to respond to that with anything other than thank you for your email, which sounds awful and dismissive, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, so, so I'm saying publicly that I would love to have more conversations, and 
our email addresses and our phone numbers are all on the website, and I encourage you to reach out to any of us, but me in particular. And I will add to that, in case you've never sent an email to the board, but you're thinking about it, this is the reason why the chair does the responding. Because if we each chime in and respond to your email, now we're in an unofficial announce, unannounced meeting. And so it's been the practice of the board that the chair speaks for the board in that response to you. And um, that I just want to make that clear so that if you do email the board and you hear from me and you're wondering why didn't you hear from Jenna or Lori or Naomi or Ken, that is the reason. But I do want to echo what Naomi said. We appreciate the communication that we get. I read every email that comes and I take it into consideration. I mean, some like with certain, like with the budget cuts, for example, we were so inundated. I mean, thank goodness it was the chair's, sorry, Ken. <laughs> You're so, welcome. So thankful it wasn't my job to respond to everybody, but I read every single one and I took each bit of information to heart. And, you know, that is a good way to have us know what you think as a community member because we are. It's, I mean, obviously not everybody's, but I can go, oh, I got five people who think it's, this is a great idea and seven people who think this is the worst idea they've ever heard, right? So at least I have a little sample to work with. It does help. And so I, I do appreciate that um, very much. If you think of it, you can put it in comments. <laughs> All right. New business, memo of agreement between the school board and the Merrimack Teachers Association regarding retirement provision for 23-24. Yes, we, uh, as you remember, we discussed, uh, because it is a collective bargaining issue, in a non-public session, we have a, a, an employee who has given many, many years of outstanding service to the Merrimack uh, School District. And there was a provision in the MTA contract in terms of a retirement incentive um, payment uh, that actually has some benefit to us in that uh, when we lose a staff member at a higher level of the salary, we oftentimes are able to hire someone at a lower salary level. But this person uh, is um, just shy of the stipulated criteria of 15 years, uh, and I mean just shy of that. And we have decided that it, it would be appropriate to enter into a one-time agreement, uh, and the MTA is in uh, support of this to uh, provide the retirement, early retirement incentive to this employee. Do you need us to vote on this? Yes, okay. we do. So I, I make a motion that we accept the memo of agreement between the school board and the MTA regarding this one-time retirement provision. Second. Seconded by Jenna. All those in favor or discussion? I'll do discussion first. <laughs> now all those in favor, raise your hand. Right. Five, zero, zero. Thank you very much. Now we're going to move on to our responsive classroom presentation and we have our wonderful elementary principals here and I invite you to come forward. I like how they let us come up here and they all stayed right there. So thank you for having us. Um, with me is Kate Merva, who is a teacher at JMUs. And so she and I are going to um, present today, but please know that Julie DeLuca of Thornton's Ferry, Bonnie Painchode of Reed's Ferry, and Nikki Rowe um, at the upper elementary school have all been a part of the conversations all year. Um, and all are consistent in what we're about to share. So as you know, at the elementary level, we have been extremely busy this year. We have, with our implementation, full year implementation of foundations, with Mystery Science, iReady, one of, um, and a few others, one of the most impressive and I think the most meaningful across all four schools initiatives or consistency that we've brought, um, and thank you to Amy Doyle for supporting this as well, is been in the area of responsive classroom. 
So Responsive Classroom is really a model about building a community within your classroom and within your school and how you interact with each other and your curriculum, your teachers, and everyone else in um, the building. So we just have a couple of really brief slides we're going to share with you about the parts of Responsive Classroom that we have implemented across all three, uh, four buildings this year. Um, some slightly different in ways that we've done it, but overall we have stayed very, very consistent in the parts that we've implemented. <laughs> So the first part that happens in every classroom from preschool, um, actually through grade six, is a morning meeting. And during the morning meeting, the students have, it's very structured, there's a question. The goal of the morning meeting is to get to know your students, each other, and also the day that's in front of you. So in this particular picture, this is a second grade classroom. Um, they're playing a game, there's a greeting, then there's an activity or a game as part of each morning meeting. So they're playing like a telephone kind of game in this one. I also do want to say we have some classrooms across the district that have also implemented closing circles or closing meetings where, especially in classrooms where all students aren't there at a particular time of the day or they're not all there for their morning meeting, although we've made it a priority for as many kids as we can and staff that they attend morning meeting, we do make sure there's closing um, meetings which do a similar, um, have a similar rationale, similar purpose, except the part of that is to share what the day has been about and what kids have taken from the day. Um, one of the things that we've done across the buildings is that in each building in some way, every adult is a part of a morning meeting. So a classroom teacher obviously is involved, however, all of the other staff are assigned to a classroom, and they met with the group every day um, for, with that one particular classroom throughout the school year, which has been an amazing thing to watch staff members who may not have had anything to do with a particular grade level just because of their placement, they now have relationships with kids outside of what they would have known. The other thing that we've done that's worked really well is while our classroom teachers are in our professional learning teams, the unified arts teachers are with the students. And on those days now, our unified arts teachers run a morning meeting with their classroom. So they go to the classroom that they typically are in um, and then they do also rotate, but they choose the activity, they do the message, they do um, the greeting, and they do the, the activity as well. Therefore, they've gotten the kids off all in the same routine, the same structure and consistency that they're used to. When the teachers come back from their meeting, they're, they're ready to start the day. So morning meeting has absolutely transformed um, all of our schools. So the other part that we've been um, that we've all agreed to implement this year was a morning message in some way shape or form so each day the teacher leaves an actual message for the kids some of the some of the time the kids are starting to leave the messages um, and the goal of that again is to give the kids some idea of what's happening during their day so that they know what to expect or what's happening sometimes there's a little there's a question or there's um, something for the kids to work on you'll notice in this particular picture the student is actually she's become the teacher so she's doing the morning message Message. and the signature is from a second grade teacher and um, a special educator who are paired up and they meet together for their morning um, meeting each day. And then one of the other parts that we've all done this year is classroom expectations to school expectations. So what you have here, this is a third grade classroom who they work together and this happened at every level. So from our preschoolers up through our fourth graders and then at the upper L, they worked on creating their classroom expectations, which is something that we have done for many, many years. However, the next step that we took is there were representatives from different classes that came together with our school counselor and our social emotional learning specialist and they consolidated and came up with themes and they put together the grade level goals and the grade level expectations. And then from there we had representation from kindergarten through fourth grade who met again and took those consolidated rules and we came up with our three school-wide expectations and those are hanging in every classroom, they're in the lunchroom, um, we talk to our bus drivers about them, so they're everywhere that kids would be, we have the same expectations and they started with what, does, what do you need in your classroom to be a learner? What are your goals for yourself this school year? What kind of conditions do you need to make that happen? What do you need your classroom to look like, to feel like? 
And then from there, what do you, what do you want your hallway, your grade, and then your school? What do you want from your school? Um, so then those were the, the parts that there's, there are many other parts of um, responsive classroom when we've done different things in different grades in different buildings. We have book talks going. Um, there's more, there's whole class, whole school meetings in some. So we're really excited about the next steps of implementation. But Kate's going to share her personal journey with responsive classroom this year. The button and the, there we go. Now we're on. Well, thank you all tonight for being here, um, and congratulations on the reelections. It's good to see so many familiar faces. And I've been in Merrimack for almost 17 years, and I'm just so grateful to the board and to our school district because you guys create and powerful things for all of us, and it trickles down. So I'm here tonight. I'm completing my 16th year in Merrimack. Uh, I've taught at Reeds Ferry, and I've taught now at GMU's grades third through fifth. Um, and responsive classroom is my favorite topic, and it's sort of the foundation of all of my teaching. Um, I did my student teaching in Western Mass at one of the schools that was a magnet school for the creators of responsive classroom. So I was alongside some of the writers of the responsive classroom books. I was able to have adjunct professors in responsive classroom, and it really embedded to all of us, you know, fresh new teachers, sort of the methodologies about respect and community that we want to have all students have. Um, my gift for my mentor teacher was the first six weeks of school, which is the powerful responsive classroom book that you sort of look at how do you set a community in the beginning of the school year. And it's a book that I take out every single August, 17 years running, and I reread it, and I re-highlight it, and I write tons of little notes on notepaper, and it just really grounds my teaching and I think the teaching for many of us here in Merrimack. Um, so with district support, I've had the opportunity to do almost every single training Responsive Classroom has, and that has just been a wonderful thing that we've been able to do over professional development. I've been certified in levels one and two Responsive Classroom. I have gone through the presenter certification, which requires videos and requires essays and recommendations from leadership in the district. So that's all been just a powerful piece. And one thing that I loved Responsive Classroom doing was during the pandemic, they were right there for us. They did so many virtual trainings, and that was the time where I felt I was losing my community like so many of us were, and it was the time where they really stepped up and talked about how can we connect kids again even though we're through a screen. And some of their workshops during that time were just some of the most powerful things I've gone through. Um, and Responsive Classroom has kind of been at the forefront of you know all trauma-informed instruction, all student-informed instruction. It's building children's ability to work together and create a community and how community will drive us forward no matter what is going on. So I love that. Um, responsive Classroom has the tenets of cooperation, assertiveness, responsibility, empathy, self-control. And these are things that I hold dear as I walk in every single day teaching in Merrimack. Um, it creates that strong community. So every day we start with that morning meeting and I never skip it. It doesn't matter if we have a two hour delay, we're still doing morning meeting. It doesn't matter if we've had a meeting, we're still doing morning meeting because it groups all the students together. They all make eye contact, they all sit down, they all can see each other and we go through you know, daily expectations, what to expect, what's happening today, anything weird, anything going on. It lets students share and have a voice. Sometimes some of my quietest students, this is the one time they will speak with confidence. And that is a powerful time to give them the floor to discuss anything from weekend activities to how they feel about the book we're reading to you know what they think about the next special we're about to do. So it gives students the chance to share and the chance to build voice. And then we always play a cooperative game. I never skip the game. The game is so important to community building. To have kids play something non-competitive with each other, to laugh with each other every day, to value each other, to cheer winners, to cheer you know respectful exchanges when somebody loses, is so important that even if it is seven minutes long where we play silent ball and they're chucking that silent ball around, okay, it is an important, powerful seven minutes in there because they're connected. They love each other, they respect each other, and they're ready to move forward. And then we end our time with that message piece that Michelle was talking about where either it's a quote or it's a thought-provoking comment. A lot of times with the upper grades, now that I'm teaching fifth, it's letting them vote and make critical decisions. Like, oh, we had a rocky transition walking in from lunch yesterday. What can we do as a team to fix that? How can we help our community? 
and they vote and they come up with the solutions. And that is way better than me standing there going, <laughs> right? So I feel like responsive classroom builds leadership. It builds the act of value with everyone. And it really lets every student be heard, whereas so many other times somebody might feel self-conscious to speak up. Um, so we always, even with my switch class, which I have halfway through the day, we do a morning meeting. It's a little shorter because I only have them for 90 minutes, but we start as a circle. And even though it's 11.45 in the day, we have to tap in. Otherwise, it's not going to run smoothly, which I love. Um, so as I mentioned, I've gone through the grade levels, third through fifth in Merrimack, and it's exciting to kind of see how a responsive classroom builds as children grow through the program. You know, you go from those little kids sitting in that carpet to now these big fifth graders sitting in camping chairs around the rug, but it's still, it's still that circle. It's still honoring each other. It's still making the eye contact, the active listening, the problem solving, the contributing as a team. And they learn the communal dialogue of what the things look like, sound like. How can we pr be proactive, not reactive? How can we be assertive when we're be building partnerships? This stuff is lifelong skills. It doesn't matter where they're going. They need to know how to do these things. And so it's a powerful piece of this. Another thing that we always say is, you know, how can we be quick, quiet, safe with transitions when we're doing our drills, when we're doing our safety checks? How can we maintain that kind of community? So I feel like explicitly using the response of classroom through all th my years of teaching has been amazing. It's been intentional. It's been that daily activity. Um, and we also do a lot of big community celebrations because I feel like responsive classroom is about building joy. And we want the kids in Merrimack to have that core, those core memories of laughing together, of building joy. So my classroom and all, all the other classrooms I've worked around, we do a huge celebrations. And it's not, everyone's always invited. You know, you're never, you know, you're never going to skip the exciting, you know, spring out, you know, outside game because of whatever. It's, it's the times where we all come together, we all play, we all laugh. You know, I have students that do, you know, I'll bring in specialists, I'll bring the OT person in, I'll bring the PT person in, I'll bring my students out of district tutor in because we all want to be there for that celebration. So everybody sort of makes that a priority, which I love. Um, and I'm so grateful that Merrimack has supported Responsive Classroom in so many ways with professional development for many staff and for all of us around the district. Um, it has helped me maintain just these amazing connections. I have students now who are in their mid-20s and we're still connected and we still write. And I credit Responsive Classroom and Merrimack to that because we have built a community that will never die. It's a community that will go on. And I absolutely love that. Um, so I I'm grateful to the board. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm also sick, so I apologize. I'm, a little <laughs> I'm not crying. It's okay. <laughs> no, but I'm also moved by this. I mean, I'm grateful to Merrimack for this, but I feel like Responsive Classroom is just one of the wonderful tenants we have that is just sort of the silent gatekeeper of how we be treat decent human beings and how we become decent human beings in Merrimack. So I love being a part of that. I love continuing that, and I'm grateful to get to share that with you guys tonight. Any All right, questions? comments from the board or questions? <clears throat> I'm just going to make a couple quick comments. First of all, like, it's research-based, and, you know, kids, they, they don't really care what you know until they know you care. And so, um, and in best practices, always having students know uh, what the learning objectives are for the day and have that plan takes away some of the anxiety and stress. Um, I think that your presentation was wonderful and it gets it's exciting for us because sometimes we get into policy and hearing the things that are happening in the classroom and having this enthusiastic, you know, teacher who's talking about her classroom and her kids and how much uh, passion she has is it, it gives us all a positive energy. So Good. thank you very much oh, and thank you, you Michelle too. So um, I also love Responsive Classroom. I've heard about it for years, um, but I had the opportunity to be trained to do the four-day training this year. And then I had the opportunity to jump in with Merrimax training on responding to misbehavior, which might be, in my years of being an educator, the best professional development I have ever attended. Because their, their foundation on responding to misbehavior was entirely student focused it was entirely um helping the child review what they did and and helping them fix it and it wasn't about punishment and this is the consequence you're going to get not that there wouldn't be I mean, sometimes there are consequences or, you know but 
it was I walked out of that training first of all for myself being like wow I'm gonna, I'm gonna totally approach things differently but to know that that was something that we were training our teachers in too was so exciting also as an educator who doesn't have a classroom I sit across from two second grade classrooms and I get to listen to this every morning um, sometimes I'm in a in a classroom sometimes I'm not but to see a morning meeting in our closing circle in action is really something. And to see the effect that it has on students, you, you captured it so perfectly with it, how it, it builds community. And it takes a group of kids that aren't always cohesive, believe it or not. You know, they don't always come, you know, as a cohesive group. And by the end, they're, they know each other well and they can respect each other's differences and interact in that circle like a kind of like a family would right like mm -hmm. okay we're real different but we're going to work together here for the same goals yeah. and it's really cool to watch that transformation over the years i'm very thrilled for the investment our district has made in responsive classroom because it is truly excellent education it's a framework for an excellent education yeah. so um kudos and you really described it perfectly oh, thank, thank you that. ken I say it all the time, schools are more than test scores. Uh, and I know I'm not saying test scores aren't important. They are, they're very important. Uh, and they're a great gauge and, and knowing where we need to work on things. But this is the stuff, That's this is the other side of the coin. And this is the side of the coin that a lot of people forget about uh, when they look at silly rankings and things like that. Um, this is the, in my opinion, this is the most important part of many uh, child's education. So I, I, I love it. I rave about it. I think it's one of the best things we offer our students and I'm glad to see such enthusiasm behind it. So thank you for, for giving it everything it's worth. It's awesome to see. Naomi. Um, this is something I kind of got from this and I just want to say it out loud is these are job skills. You are teaching first from, from, what is it, pre-K up through six or whatever, you're teaching them job skills. The, these skills will serve them well through their entire, entire lives. And I'm assuming they actually help with the academic portion of the day as well. And I would love to hear you say a little bit more about how that, how that applies. Like how, will, how does using Responsive Classroom improve academic performance? Yeah, I can speak to that. Is my mic back on? Okay, there we go. I'm hitting the buttons too many times. Um, I think it's, it's again, that active listening and respect piece. So when you go into doing partner work in an activity, like we, we, we're doing social study projects, and students know how to work as partnerships, and they know how to do a balanced partnership from all of the explicit training and practice we do with how to be a partner in responsive classroom. Um, public speaking is a huge skill that comes out with responsive classroom, and being comfortable to present in front of a crowd of you know small bigger like most of my students run for student council because they're comfortable standing up in front of a room and they're comfortable with applications and they're comfortable with sharing and that's huge i think also academically it allows students to tap into different student strengths like students know from working in so during those cooperative games who's you know who's competitive and who's enthusiastic and who's also going to be a good partner for me if I'm a little quieter and how to find that partner when you're doing presentations and doing activities a lot of times the responsive classroom melds academics into our morning meetings and allows us to sort of play with material that may seem daunting so a lot of time we'll introduce new concepts and tougher like vocabulary in a morning meeting as a game. And so it is more approachable. It is also easier to remember. We use multiple intelligences. I do a lot of clapping and singing and a lot of clapping and singing happens and therefore it's th skills stick. I think those are pieces. I don't know, Michelle, am I, wa am I rambling? Anything else you want to add? No, not at all. Okay. I, I, yeah. <laughs> Scheme to it, Nikki, I'm rambling. I got her sick. <laughs> I'm sick too. We're sick. But I couldn't miss this. Um, can you hear me okay? I just have to say, being an administrator and walking, are you guys okay if I do this down? I'm not close enough to anybody. Um, being an administrator and walking into a classroom and watching the tenants of uh, this play out is quite extraordinary. I, I watched a teacher say to the students, um, how are we gonna choose partners today? And the students picked two different ways. And then the teacher reminded them, be assertive and be kind. You always have to make an agreement that if you ask someone to be your partner, that they agree and they want to be your partner back. And so 
the children chose how they were going to pick partners. And there was a group of four kids that were left. And um, they were struggling. And so the teacher went over and said, OK, what do we do now? And one of the students said, well, can we all four be partners? Because we want to be partners with different people in this group. And the teacher said, how do you think that will work? And they talked through it. And they decided, yes, they were going to do that. And so I watched the groups. And this one group of four was bigger, and so they had more of a challenge. And I watched one of the students say, OK, we're a bigger group. Let's check in. <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh my goodness, the management of this is just so incredible. And all of those pieces were from that language of responsive classroom. And um, when we look at the rubric that we use for evaluation of teachers, when you look at highly effective, that's typically student-led learning. And so responsive classroom has that impact on what we want and what we know is best for kids to take over learning and to make decisions about learning. And so to watch just that group figure that out and then for the student to say, wait, let's have a check-in. Like, we are, we're a big group. We have a lot of different ideas going on um, was just evidence of what we're really trying to do. So I love um, one of the things that, I love about morning meeting is when I'm walking in, I'm always greeted and like, oh, we're doing morning meeting. They come over, or like there'll be questions about like, what did you do this weekend? Or um, what do you think about this? So it really is that um, that sense of family and you can, and you can tell it in the group. So uh, when you ask that question of how, do, how does it impact learning and how does it impact uh, you know, academics. I think that's that's one of the ways watching kids collaborate and learn from each other and hear each other and respect each other's voices. So I appreciate that. So I kind of have a question for the principals, and I appreciate the macro level of, of what you see in the classroom, but what would you say is the most significant cultural proficiency outcome that you have seen at the building level with implementing a responsive classroom? I think for at MES right now, I would say that, while not surprising, what has been really, really powerful is the pro act because it's so proactive in teaching kids the expectations and what's coming and what's happening. That the level of independence that kids have, even our kindergartners whose morning meeting is a little bit shorter, um, they can run through that morning meeting independently and then therefore parts of their day so in thinking about you know how is it impacting them academically their transitions their conversations even their snack times like it's so cute to see kindergartners say everyone at the table is not talking and so they'll ask a specific question what's one of the things you know everyone's a part of morning meeting and to watch the kids i and i think the second part is i think our kids and adults know more about each other because of that ritual every morning that morning meeting where you're learning about each other that there's no way you know you would know in the builds those connections so I know that those are two of the most powerful things for MES I don't know if anybody else yes yes <laughs> so um, as a classroom teacher I I had morning meeting in my um, classroom and as an administrator now seeing it being run in all classrooms is really powerful um, just examples of when a sub is in and the children take over and the sub is more just a part of it because they don't know how naturally it runs and the students know and so the independence the ownership that they take and it then permeates in our UAs, because all, all of our UAs have been um, trained on uh, responsive classrooms. So it's in every aspect of, uh, of the school. So it's the independence, it's the um, safe environment where students trust each other to have each other and support each other. And that's really important when you're learning things and you're gonna make mistakes and that's hard for children. And so when you're in a responsive classroom community, you've you spent so much time building that community that you truly are a supportive community of each other. And the last thing I wanted to say was children are involved in 
the creation of things. So um, like interactive modeling is incredibly important for responsive classrooms. So if you have a certain expectation, you model it, you practice it. If we don't do so well at it, we go back and we model it and we practice it as a classroom and sometimes as a school. We just had a, an assembly this morning and we've been doing a lot of silent clapping and so now we're working on how to actually clap <laughs> 500 kids in a room with some you know with students who have sensory issues how to do it respectfully so our student council has taken the charge in how to practice that so again that's that interactive modeling and it's it's a real power it's a real strength for our schools one of the pieces that I think um, we've mentioned a couple times but should definitely not be overlooked is the training of the UA teachers. Mm. Um, I was with a UA teacher last week, and he explained to me that Responsive Classroom has completely changed the way that he runs his music classroom. And um, I was there. I was able to see um, peer interaction and peer assessment. And it was so cool to watch that the language that we're using in class and um, you know, all the lessons that they learned about being assertive but being kind and um, watch that play out in a music classroom. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had a long conversation about um, responsive classroom and music and um, he was very grateful and said, thank you so much for including us. So I think um, as we move forward, and Jenna, you talked about that amazing training, um, we continue to grow and to learn. And I think it's just um, when, when Bill had asked us to present, we kind of looked at each other and we said, like, this is something that we just have to share because it's been so powerful. So we thank you for giving us this opportunity to share it. The, the one last thing I did want to say for new teachers, you know, when you become a new teacher, it's, it's, there's a lot. And so Responsive Classroom is a really great foundation on how to set up your classroom. The six weeks of school, the morning activities, the morning greetings. There's a lot of resources that new teachers can really hold on to and, and dig into to help um, manage their classroom and creating that to create that community. Jenna? Um, I just wanted to say this. Uh, this is an interesting example, but because it happened to me this week, you know, ours is a responsive classroom, and I went into um, a morning meeting, and there was I, I got there a little late, so I got there for the activity, and the activity was going to happen, and you had to stand back to back and share something. I don't remember what it was, but I stood back to back with a student, and then when he turned to me, this kid who I usually interact with at recess, who's kind of um, just kind of like the cool kid, you know, very athletic, whatever. And the first thing he said to me was, good morning, Mrs. Hardy. And I don't know why, but I was like, what, what? Because maybe everybody else's kids do that, but n nobody does. Like most kids don't naturally say, mm -hmm. good morning, whoever the adult is, right? Mm -hmm. But he, that because, because of Responsive Classroom, that is how they mm -hmm. greet each other in the morning. And that is the way we are teaching kids to interact. So he said that to me and, it, and I was like, Good morning, <laughs> you know, and I was like, wow, every, so much of what we do often becomes transactional, but it's teaching kids to connect. And it also, the thing that it does, it's super cool as that I see working in SEL is it takes the, the kids that are really good relationally and the kids that really struggle socially and relationally. And it sets these kids up for, as an example, because every day they have to look at each other in the eyes and greet each other. And that connection, right, it's really hard for some kids and it's literally no big deal for other kids, but it really does become the norm so that when I walk in, I get a, good morning, Mrs. Hardy. And I'm like, wow, that is, I gotta teach my kids that. Like, <laughs> you know, not Mrs. Hardy, but you know, I mean, just really simple, but really so foundational that you don't realize how transformative it is. Well, thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it very much. All right, so let's talk about what families and students across the district are dying to know the last <laughs> day of school. Thank you. Um, as you know, I've, I've provided you with a memo that um, outlines some of the requirements for the school year in terms of numbers of days, number of instructional hours uh, in accordance with RSA 189. One and ED 30618. Um, we are required to have 180 days in a school year. However, the state provides an option also 
for districts to meet a certain number of instructional hours, and that is 450 hours at the kindergarten level, 945 hours at the grades one through six, and 990 hours in grades um, in middle school and high school, excuse me. In uh, doing the calculation of a number of instructional hours, uh, we actually meet that requirement prior to the 180 days uh, with uh, several days of wiggle room. So our original end date of the school year was um, Friday, June 14th. We have had, um, uh, excuse me, our, um, our original last day, excuse me, was um, Monday, June 17th, okay? Um, we have had a couple of no school days, uh, which moves us to the 18th and the 19th, that Tuesday and Wednesday. However, in calculating the instructional hours, we are in excess of 1,000 instructional hours at the upper grade levels and uh, a little bit over 1,000 for the elementary grade levels as of June 14th, that Friday. So I'm recommending to you a change to the school calendar for this year and would request a vote on this that our last day of school be Friday, June 14th, June 17th, 18th, and 19th. That following week, because there's a weekend in between, will be three professional development days uh, because those days are needed for uh, the collective bargaining compliance with the number of work days. All right? so, and we can use those very, very advantageously for a number and variety of professional activities. Uh, what this does not do is this does not change the date of graduation. And the date of graduation is, it has to be within five days, no more than five days from the original last day of school, notwithstanding any changes and cancellation days due to inclement weather emergencies, etc. So graduation will still be on uh, Saturday, June 15th, this year, but once again, recommending the last day for students, that will be a half day, okay, because uh, our last day is a half day, will be Friday, June 14th. Jenna. So um, I, I know we all got an email about this, um, but as the parent of a senior, I will be the one to ask this question. The Hawk Walk is scheduled for the 14th. I assume that can still go forward without issue on the 14th. Yeah, we were just talking about that today, and I know they, um, they all left. But yeah. yes, we're working on that. It's uh, trying to coordinate it with the arrival of caps and gowns and, and those types of things. But yes, we are moving forward with the Hawk Walk, and we're actually trying to work in a stop at the middle school as well. Love so. it. Thank you. So I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to accept the last day of school as presented of June 14th. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Five zero zero. All right, thank you. All right, now let's talk about our summer meeting dates for the board. Lori, for your uh, frame of reference, may I just state that um, your meeting dates last summer were on July 10th and August 14th. If we follow that same time frame model, this year's meetings would be on Monday, July 8th and Monday, August 12th, if you choose to keep the same type of uh, time frame. So I'll open it up to the board for those dates. I will be at a conference on June 8th, July 8th, excuse me, July 8th through the 10th. It's also the Monday after what's probably going to be for a lot of people a long 4th of July weekend. Could we do the 15th, we do the 15th instead or no? We could. That's, yeah. that's up to you. We can do that. I'm good for the 15th. Yeah, the Everybody else good great. for the 15th? I, th okay. I think so. You think so? <laughs> I think so. Well, there's four of us. I think we're, I think... Four of us are good with the 15th, yeah. and we'll wait to hear back from Ken. Yep. All right, so we'll do, we'll tentatively set for the 15th of July and August 12th. That one's fine with me, yep. Not, I don't know why I'm the one. <laughs> <laughs> it's my schedule, guys. No, that one's, uh, no, I think that one's Oops. good. 
So I make a motion that we accept those dates for our summer meeting, July 15th and August 12th? Yes. Yeah. I'll sure. second. Okay. All those in favor of those dates? Yeah. Aye. Five zero zero. <clears throat> Chair? Yes. Um, is there any way we can talk about the summer goals meeting, uh, trying to get a date for that? Um, I think that's a really important date for everyone. That's so our next agenda item. I mean, no, for our goals meeting? Yes, that's the next agenda item. Okay. Date for our June goals meeting. Oh, okay. Yes, <laughs> I missed that. Sorry. No worries. All right. So you all have professional development the 17th, 18th, and 19th. So right. what were you thinking for goals based on well, your administration as schedule? As a frame of reference, in the last two years, in uh, 2022, your meeting was on June 28th. Last year, it was a little bit earlier on June 22nd. Now, the only concern I have is if we were to follow last year's, that would put us on June 20th, which would be the day after the contract right. ends. I think it's too, too early. Too soon. So we could do it um, for whatever reason. We chose a Thursday last year, a Tuesday the year before. Uh, if you want to stay with those two days of the week, we could either do a Tuesday... Uh, June 25th or Thursday, June 27th. How are, how's everybody for June 25th? I like the 25th. I, I have a wedding in Virginia. I, I know it's a weird day for a wedding, but <laughs> we have a wedding in Virginia So on the 25th. What about so the 27th? So the 27th, we should be home. I can make either work. Yeah. Okay, June 27th. June 27th I'll entertain yeah. a motion for the 27th for our goals meeting. I make a motion that we have our annual school board goal setting meeting on June 27th, which is a Thursday. A oh. second. All those in favor? Five zero zero. All right, thank you. All right, other new business. <clears throat> I have two. Um, we talked last week uh, uh, about the performance evaluation of the superintendent. Uh, Ken and I had a few discussions. So uh, we have performance indicators um, for the superintendent on educational readership, school district culture, school district goals, school district management. Um, and then I also added relationship with the board. Um, and so uh, what I'd like to do is um, just give every one of this tonight, have people electronically send this and we'll start putting it together and uh, we'll put together the evaluation of the superintendent. And then the second new business would be if we could add to the next agenda meeting a uh, discussion on improving communication and looking at adding new committees that would support improving communication and things that we feel that would be important to move our district forward. Which also aligns with our goal setting meeting yes. from last year. So. And we should probably get started on that since it's, you That know. seems like a good time, yeah. <laughs> I would also like to add something to our next agenda meeting, and it can either be in person or a written report. Uh, just uh, Tom Tussaud can answer a lot of the questions regarding fields and preparation and just the annual um, expectations for field prep. And I think it would be good for the board to have a report. Um, I can draft a lot of those questions and, and send them. But I think uh, we need to address that publicly. Any other new business? Okay, we have one policy in the agenda tonight, updated suicide prevention response plan. Can you all hear me? Uh, good to see you again, Ford, and congratulations on two new chairs. It's lovely to hear that um, so many people have such faith in our community and our board. Uh, my policy update is very quick. When I was reviewing our policy in preparation for our training in May for all staff, which is mandatory around suicide prevention, I noticed our policy suggests or states um, that we need to have warning signs within our suicide prevention plan. When I looked over the plan, there was not a section on warning signs, so I just added that section. Um, and I took the information directly from the 988 website. Um, and so that is the only addition, just to make sure our plan matches our policy. Questions or comments from the board, Lori? So I just have 
so I, I know this is, um, we spent a lot of time on the uh, suicide prevention. Um, again, I just, when we say that each principal will have a team of individuals, um, I would really appreciate if we could have a crisis team that we actually list who's on that team. So every single year, we know that the principal, the assistant principal, the director of guidance, um, the director of special education, who is our crisis team? And then that team actually, um, you know, as, as we say in the policy, we'll, we'll meet and discuss situations that may or may not happen, but we know who they are. So, so that's my only thing. I just really wish we would say crisis team and then know who those people are. Mm -hmm. I believe currently the schools do have brochures that there are um, crisis management brochures that go out to parents if a student is involved in some sort of crisis or concern that does state the staff within the school building, but we can work on having um, one central location that has all crisis teams for each building and then an overall crisis team listed. Thank you. I do have a couple of questions just for understanding. On the first page, it says all screenings done in schools will be reported as part of a system-wide data collection effort to support the mental health and well-being of all students. What data is being collected and what is um, the purpose of holding on to that data? Sure, so um, it's important when you have a student that's having some sort of mental health crisis um, to keep documentation on that. We are required to report that to the state. Um, so when we screen a student for a mental health concern, we just need to keep that for yearly reporting. And then my other question, and, and believe me, I, I had a very, very, very close friend in high school who um, died by suicide. So this is very near and dear to my heart. So I don't want to minimize the concern or the prevention policy at all. But I do have another concern. On the bottom of page four, um, when we're talking about that, when we're talking about parental notification of a student that's been identified, mm -hmm. um, because firearms and medications are the most lethal method of suicide attempts, the following will be adopted as part of the procedures for student safety. Inquire of the parent or guardian if firearms are kept in the home or otherwise accessible to the student if any other residence the child may visit. Should the child or parent indicate the presence of firearms, the administrator or designee will inform police who will review gun safety measures. I'm concerned that since we are a right to carry state, mm -hmm. that um, informing the police and having them interact with the parent is a violation of their right under New Hampshire law. We can review that part of the plan and make sure that it's not in regards to anything specific to state law. Um, and as long as it's not, we can have a conversation about the best way to make sure that our students are safe without yes. infringing on others' rights. Yes, absolutely. And, and I appreciate us being able to look into that. And I was just going to say, I think that um, what happens just from um, personal knowledge of being an administrator is uh, they make recommendations for the families to uh, bring the guns to the police station, that they are kept there during the period of time that the student is receiving um, medical care. While I can see that as a possible recommendation, I can also see that um, there would be quite a few people who would consider that a violation if they are responsible as gun owners to keep them locked and saved and the child does not have access to them, that it may be um, a perceived as a coercive step by law enforcement. So I just think we need to look into it for good language. Any other comments or thoughts from the board? I just wanted to say thank you for noticing that we were missing something that we were supposed to have and taking the initiative to get it put in there and bring it before us and for answering our challenging questions. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We do appreciate that. And I also wanted to add to Lori, thank you for answering the question about who would we need to reach out to personally, not just the title. So I appreciate your response to that question. So with this, we will um, put it on another future agenda item once we have those questions answered. Thank you. Thank you. All right, approval of the minutes, the April 1st, 2024 public hearing, the public and non-public minutes. Do I have a motion? We, we just have to make a correction because they spelt my last name wrong twice. Uh-oh. <laughs> 
I have a correction. And too. I didn't take it personally. It was fine. So where, where? Oh uh, gosh. Uh, in non-public. I, I caught it. Uh, it's on page one of one. On the. Right here. I'll just pass it down. Okay. I had a correction as well. At the bottom of page one, um, someone, the person who transcribes our minutes, it says that I explained that the district already had a phoenix, which oh. is, I think that is supposed to be phonics. phonics. Uh, which is a mythical bird. <laughs> yeah, I would like one, but I, alas, I do not. I had no idea we had one of those. It's so cool. Any other corrections? All right, I make a motion to accept the public minutes. Um, with the correction of phonics. <laughs> Second. <laughs> All those in favor of accepting the public minutes? Five zero zero. And uh, we will correct the non public and vote on those again. All right, the consent agenda. It's just Assistant Superintendent Amy Doyle. Yeah, there are, this is the time of year where you will hear resignations, retirements, and then as well as um, folks that we are nominating to replace some of those positions. So I'll start with teacher retirements. Um, Barb De Francisco, who has extensive um, service to the Thornton's Ferry um, School, has uh, submitted her intent to retire at the end of this school year. Uh, she'll be joined by many other familiar names. Um, Eleni Flores, who's a science teacher at the high school. Karen King, special education teacher at the high school. Kathleen King, special education teacher at the high school. Claire Mitchell, elementary teacher at JMU's. Um, Christine Reinhardt, who's been a long time special ed coordinator at the high school. Cheryl Smith, the math coordinator at the middle school. Carol Smith, math teacher at the high school and Pat Zink, special education teacher at the high school. I just want to take a minute to thank these um, many teachers for their dedication and service and the lives that they have touched here in Merrimack, and we wish them all the best uh, on the next journey. Thousands of students on that list right there. We'll also um, accept the resignations tonight um, by the following teachers, Morgan Bailey, special education teacher at Thornton's Ferry, Sarah Demers, school counselor at Merrimack Middle School, Michaela Eason, math teacher at Merrimack High School, Denver Green, physical education teacher at Thornton's Ferry, Marina Nickerson, special education teacher at the middle school, Lauren Sorensen, elementary classroom teacher at Thornton's Ferry, and Paige Webster Scribner, English teacher at the high school. And again, these folks, um, most of them are moving on, um, either out of state or they've taken other positions, um, and we wish them well in their next endeavor. And then finally, um, it's with mixed emotions that um, I put forth the administrator resignation of Laura Livy, um, who has been in the district. Um, she's worked at Reeds, she's worked at Muse, she's been a social emotional learning specialist, she's been a counselor, um, and she'll um, be sorely missed in her role as the assistant principal at Reeds Ferry. Um, and as I said, it's mixed, emo mixed emotions. Uh, Laura is moving on to her first principalship. So we wish her all the very best. And then some of those positions are being replaced tonight. Um, and as you will see some of our postings, um, Lindsay Middleton comes to us as a, a new language arts teacher at Merrimack Middle School. Leanne Keller, science teacher at Merrimack Middle School. And um, William Hewen, um, school counselor for Merrimack High School. I'll entertain a motion to accept the consent agenda. I move that we accept the consent agenda as presented. I second it. Seconded by Lori. All those in, well, discussion. Lori. I just want to um, thank the teachers and teacher retirements. If you look at the number of years, it's over 200 years of experience and that we're losing. And a lot of these teachers um, have been dear to our hearts. I mean, they've done so many wonderful things for the Merrimack School District. So I want to wish them all luck. And with the teacher resignation, same thing. But just the resignations, it, it's hard when they retire. But um, we really appreciate their service. And I would echo that sentiment. I know a number of those teachers. And I also understand um, what a challenge it is to lose math teachers. 
and, <laughs> and science teachers. So um, thank you so much for your service, and we wish you all the best as you move on, whether it's in retirement or new adventures. With that, I will um, call the question. All those in favor? Five zero zero. Great committee reports. Do we have any? Didn't think so. All right, uh, correspondence. I think we all got the, yes. the correspondence about um, which graduation date being moved due to the the last day of school date. Yes. Yeah, it's been a quiet couple of weeks. It has been since last Tuesday, yes. anyway. <laughs> Lori. I just want um, the public to know that in correspondence, um, the Merrimack Forum or the Merrimack Positive Forum is not correspondence. So if someone has an issue, they really need to follow how we are going to answer a correspondence. So through our emails, please send it out. But um, like we said earlier, there's a reason why we don't go on and answer those questions. But we are um, very open and we want to hear what people have to say but that's not our, our mode of, of communication. And I would add to that that um, we're working all day long. We don't have time to monitor the forums and we have families, we have board responsibilities, committees, things like that. And so um, one original post can generate 157 comments and that's just beyond the scope of the board's communication level. And we like to hear directly. Obviously, you know, during the elections, we had to do a lot to get word out. Yes. But um, I'm very glad to have my life back <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> I, again, I want to thank everyone who um, has participated in the process since the deliberative session and through the election, particularly the MESA contract. Very grateful for that. I look forward to um, hearing from the public um, with Thursday night's meeting and I really again invite the public to be a part of that because it's how we're going to come together and rebuild and move forward in the district. Are there any other comments from the board? All right well with that I will um, invite the public to comment on public agenda or, or agenda items and again please state your name and address and if you're a student you do not need to state your address. Jeannie Wagner for Cowan Road. Um, due to the population with whom I work, I don't always see you when you come in to tour the buildings. So I would encourage you to stop by. Um, you're more than welcome any time. I hope that you have come in all six schools at least a couple of times a year to really see what's going on yourself. So thank you. Hi, Rosemary Rung, 21 Ministerial Drive. Um, piggybacking on, on what the previous speaker said, um, and I hate to always say when I was on the board, but, um, and it was before these meetings were broadcast, but we used to um, have a meeting at each school. Uh, probably we'd have like, one meeting at one school and then we'd have the other one at the high school and then we would do that. But we also accompanied them with listening sessions. So the first half hour, people were welcome to come in and just ask us any questions, um, raise concerns, and then we would go into the formal meeting. But that might be something to consider is to kind of rotate your school board meetings. I know it makes it very difficult with the taping of the, of the meetings, but it is helpful to go on a parent's turf. They're more comfortable probably going to the school where their children attend and be able to meet you there and, and share any concerns that you have. And it also gives an opportunity to see any special things going on at the schools. So thank you. Any more that would like to speak up? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? Five zero zero. Thank you. Good night. We'll see you Thursday.